Hello, my name is Peter Hoare. I'm Professor of Chemistry at the University of Oxford in the United Kingdom. And what we will be talking about today is some of my research into the mechanism by which migratory birds sense the direction of the Earth's magnetic field and use it to help them navigate when they fly thousands of kilometers between their breeding grounds and their wintering grounds every year. So to begin with, why do scientists suspect that birds evolved the ability to sense the Earth's magnetic field? And what advantages does this afford for birds? Okay, so I guess the reason they evolved the ability to sense the Earth's magnetic field was that it simply was there. Um, it's, the Earth's magnetic field is pretty constant. Um, it's present at times when other directional information is not there. The sun and the stars, for example, are not always visible, but the Earth's magnetic field is always there. And so if you have the ability to sense not just the presence of the field, but its direction, then that gives you some idea of where, um, in which direction to fly. So just like a magnetized compass needle um, is useful to a human to determine direction, the same would be true of a bird needing to fly a few thousand miles from its breeding ground to its wintering ground and back again. And really anything that gives the bird a slightly better chance of surviving that astonishing journey will give it um, an advantage in terms of evolution. So you know, even a rudimentary magnetic compass, if it helps the birds to find their way, say from Scandinavia to North Africa, then that will um, give them an advantage uh, and it will be something that will be optimized through evolution. So it's clear that birds use a variety of different directional information. I mentioned sun and stars. They also use a sense of smell. That can be very helpful under some circumstances. Um, but it is very clear that they also have a magnetic compass. And so using all the available information integrated somehow or other in the brain, they can derive um, reach a decision on which direction in which they need to flow. So is it known whether um, their ability to, to sense the, the magnetic field is an innate or learned behavior? Yeah, I think it's, it's a mixture of um, innate ability and learned ability. Um, so one feature of small migratory songbirds is that the, the young birds on their first flight fly alone. Typically, the parents will have left the previous week, and then the birds fly alone, so not accompanied by uh, experienced individuals. So they need the compass really from the word go. Um, but it's also true that on their first flight, the birds are rather less well oriented than experienced birds. So the evidence seems to be that um, their sense of geographic position is something that they need to learn by experiencing the local magnetic field around the location of their, where they were hatched, and then also the field during the journey and then on arrival at their destination. But the compass seems to be inbuilt, innate. And what do they perceive? Uh, we just don't know. Um, the receptors, there's pretty good evidence, are in the bird's eyes. And so it's possible that they form a visual image, maybe, or a visual perception of some kind that might allow them, in some sense, to see the Earth's magnetic field. Now, we don't know whether that's the case or not, um, as will become clear as we go on with this conversation, there are many things we don't yet understand.
um, about um, magnetic navigation. Right. And so you also mentioned in your explanation that the birds like sensing the magnetic field only really becomes useful in their migration after they've been also to the place that they need to end up in in their migration because that's when they sense okay so this is what the magnetic field is like at this place i need to migrate to so how do they know originally how to get to that place yeah so as i said the there are different stages in a migratory journey um so the most important thing is to set off in more or less the right direction. So they need the magnetic compass um, right from the beginning. So that's innate. This is something that they can do um, pretty much immediately after they're hatched. Um, now, the first time they fly, um, for example, if they're going from Scandinavia to North Africa, um, they need to get to within a few hundred miles of their destination pretty reliably. But then it doesn't matter too much exactly where they stop on their first journey. And so the compass doesn't need to be incredibly accurate. Um, and their positioning also doesn't need to be incredibly accurate. So they need to have some sense of where they've got to, to know where to stop, and also the sense of direction to know in which direction to fly. The following year, when they come back, they can come back to the same tree that they nested in the previous year. So I mean, they are, in that sense, they can navigate to within a few centimeters. But that's almost certainly not using the magnetic compass to home in on that target. A compass is useful on a distant scale of hundreds of miles. But when they get closer to the target, especially if, they've, if it's not their first time, then other things take over, like recognizing landmarks or familiar smells. So these are the techniques that allow them to home in on their target. The magnetic sense is much longer range um, and that's how we think they do it. So now, um, focusing a bit more on the, the magnetic side of things, what are cryptochromes and how do they relate to the bird's ability of um, magnetoreception? Right, so cryptochromes are proteins. They're biological polymers comprised of chains of amino acids. And we think that one particular cryptochrome inside the bird's eyes in their retinas is the magnetic sensor for their magnetic compass. So um, the way we think this works is that there are chemical reactions um, initiated by light inside these proteins. And those chemical reactions are sensitive to the Earth's magnetic field, and in particular, its direction. So this is a hypothesis. Um, many people believe it's the most likely mechanism by which this compass could work, but it's certainly not proven yet. So perhaps briefly, I can tell you a bit about the history of this. So the mechanism these magnetically sensitive chemical reactions. The mechanism was discovered in a chemical context quite by accident in the 1960s. Um, by the 1970s, it was clear that there are classes of chemical reactions that involve free radicals as chemical intermediates, which are sensitive to magnetic fields. And in 1976, it was suggested that this perhaps is the way in which the birds can sense the Earth's magnetic field for their magnetic compass. It was only in the 1960s that it became clear that migratory birds really do have a magnetic compass. 
And so suggested in 1976, um, it was rather an abstract idea and the way it was presented, uh, it was rather theoretical and not many biologists took much notice until 1980, sorry, until, till, till the year 2000, 21 years ago, when the same physicist, Klaus Schulten, suggested that cryptochrome might be the molecule in which this radical pair mechanism could take place. And, and it was that that got us and other people interested in this particular hypothesis. Um, so it's known that the birds have a compass which is light dependent. If they're tested in orientation cages in blue or green light, then their compass works well and they can orient themselves magnetically. If they're tested under red or yellow light or in total darkness, then the compass doesn't work. They try to get it out of the cages in random directions rather than in the direction in which they would fly if you release them during the migratory season. So cryptochromes form radicals chemically when they absorb light. And the way that happens is that there is a molecule called flavin in the middle of the cryptochrome protein. It's a yellow compound and it absorbs blue light. And it uses that energy to form pairs of radicals within the protein. Now, radicals are fragments of molecules which have an odd number of electrons. So most molecules have an even number of electrons and those electrons pair up. And as a result, those molecules are not magnetic. But as soon as you form a radical which has an odd number of electrons, then clearly they can't all be in pairs. There has to be an odd one. And because electrons are magnetic, that makes the radicals magnetic. So by shifting an electron from one part of a molecule, in this case the cryptochrome, to another part of the molecule, you form two radicals. One is the part of the molecule that receives the electron, the other is the part of the molecule that has given the electron. And it's that pair of molecules, the so-called radical pair, which um, Shulton realized in 2000 that could be the molecule he'd been looking for for more than 20 years, a biological molecule which could form radical pairs when it absorbs light. So that, that's the, the basis of the idea. Right. And so now getting more into detail of your specific research, uh, in your research paper, you mentioned how you focused on the cryptochrome in night migratory European robins in order to study them. So what made you uh, specifically decide to choose these robins to test? Was there any specific biological traits that made it easier for them to work with or something like that? Yes, yes. So, I mean, first of all, I should make it clear that... Um, the work we do in this area is highly collaborative. So I'm a physical chemist. I have chemistry colleagues I work very closely with in Oxford, but also colleagues um, elsewhere who are biologists. Um, in particular, Henrik Mauritsen at the University of Oldenburg in Northern Germany. And he's the one who does the behavioral experiments with the migratory birds. Okay, so all the experiments um, on ro European robins, for example, in magnetic fields, they're all done um, in Oldenburg. So robins are the um, kind of standard model organism for work on magnetic orientation. So it was the species chosen by Wolfgang Wilczko in the 1960s in the first demonstration 
it was really convincing that migratory birds have a magnetic compass. And I guess he chose the European robin because it's convenient. Um, although most of the robins we see in the UK are resident all year round, um, those that live in Scandinavia fly south to North Africa um, for the winter. And in doing so, they fly over northern Germany. Um, robins are very common in Europe. Um, and so fairly easy to catch them as they flew between Scandinavia and Africa. Um, and since then, uh, a lot of this work has also focused on European robins, but also on other small migratory songbirds. Um, something like 20 different species of migratory bird have now been shown to have the same kind of negative compass. So including northern wheat hares and garden warblers and black caps and so on. So there's nothing really very special about the European robin. What is different about the cryptochrome 4 um, in relation to other cryptochromes? And how did you manage to discover it within the eye of a robin. Right, okay, so um, cryptochromes occur very widely in biology. Um, we humans have them too, and they seem to have a variety of functions. So we now know that birds have six different cryptochromes. Um, and it seems that not all of them bind this crucial flavin molecule. Now, I mentioned the flavin before. It's what allows the cryptochrome to absorb blue light. If it doesn't absorb light, then there's no chemistry, there are no radicals, and there's no magnetic field effects and no compass. OK, so the flavin is crucial. Now, it's become clear in the last few years that some of the bird cryptochromes, when you study the proteins in a purified state in the laboratory, don't bind this crucial flavin chromophore. But it was already clear before we started our, the work that we published most recently, it was already clear that the cryptochrome 4 from birds like chicken and pigeon did bind this flavin. So, I mean, that was a crucial clue that cryptochrome 4 would be the one most likely to be a magnetoreceptor. Now, also, my colleagues in Oldenburg had been studying um, different cryptochromes from birds, and they found various properties that also pointed to cryptochrome 4. So one of these was that they found that cryptochrome 4 was produced inside the birds, migratory birds, principally during the migratory seasons in the spring and the autumn. And so levels of cry 4 in the winter and the summer, when the birds are not migrating, were much lower than in spring and autumn. And that was not true of some of the other cryptochromes. And they also measured the levels of cryptochromes present within the birds during the day. Now, the best understood function of cryptochromes in many organisms, including plants and humans, is in regulation of our circadian clocks, so our 24-hour rhythms. And what they found was that cryptochrome 4 didn't show a daily pattern of expression levels, but other cryptochromes did in the birds. And so that was evidence that the other cryptochromes had a function in the circadian timing, but the cryptochrome 4 did not. And so if it's not a clock protein, it presumably has some other function. 
or several functions, one of which might be magnetic reception. So that's how it was narrowed down to be more likely to be cry four than the other cryptoprose. How did we find it? Well, um, the um, genetic material was isolated from the bird's eyes, which is where we know the receptors are for the magnetic compass, and the genome was sequenced. And then we were able to search for cryptochrome 4 in that genome, and that's where it was found. And it had close similarity to the known sequences of cryptochrome 4s from pigeon and chicken. And so then we can express that protein in bacterial cells, E. coli. So we can produce large quantities of highly pure protein uh, grown inside these bacterial cells. So in nature, are, is the protein cryptochrome 4 mostly only found in birds? Or are there other um, species and families of animals that can also... Yes, so fish and amphibians also have cryptochrome 4s. And interestingly, there is evidence that fish and amphibians also have a magnetic compass. Um, and also that it might be light dependent and so might be similar in mechanism to the birds. Much more is known about magnetic orientation in birds than in any other species, uh, including fish and amphibians. Um, and that's because of the, the migration. It provides a very convenient assay for studying magnetic orientation under carefully controlled conditions, which you don't have for animals that don't migrate large distances. So that's why we know much more about the birds than any others. But it's possible that other organisms have a similar type of magnetic compass. It's also very likely that other species which are known to have a magnetic compass probably use a different mechanism because some of those animals have a compass which is not light dependent. And that makes it less likely that it's based on radicals inside cryptoporins. So just curious, um, I remember watching a documentary where these fish, I forget which kind, but they, they had to travel a considerable distance to get to their breeding grounds. Is that um, something which uh, their ability for magnetoreception would help them in? Sure. Sure. I mean, anything that makes it more likely that they survive that journey can, in principle, be favored by evolutionary pressure, by evolutionary selection that will select those individuals that have a slightly better sense of direction. You know, many, a large fraction of these small birds um, never make it back. So there's a high rate of attrition. They may get caught by bad weather. They may get caught by predators. They may get lost. So anything that makes it slightly more likely that they get to their destination and then back again is something that will be uh, that will favor their survival. Right. And so now you explained this earlier a little bit in a previous question, but your paper mentions um, that there's a lot of quantum mechanics behind how, how birds sense the magnetic fields. So could you explain uh, specifically what quantum mechanics is involved in uh, the protein cryptochrome 4 and how it allows birds to sense magnetic fields? Right, yeah. So, I mean, first of all, it's, it's I think, important to understand why it needs to be something like quantum mechanics. So, first of all, if you think about the energy 
of interaction of the Earth's magnetic field with a molecule. It's, it's pretty small. You know, the Earth's magnetic field is not very strong. So it's about 10 or 100 times smaller than you would get on the surface of a small fridge magnet. And it's a weak magnetic field, and it interacts very weakly with biological tissue. Now, so if you ask a chemist whether such a weak interaction with a single molecule with the Earth's magnetic field could affect the outcome of the chemical reaction, then that person would probably say, there's no chance at all. The energy is just far too small. Okay, and that's a good argument for the vast majority of chemical reactions. But there are some, the ones that involve radical pairs, which are rather special. And they are sensitive to much, much weaker interactions than you would normally think could possibly affect a chemical process. And that's where the quantum mechanics comes in. So an analogy which I sometimes use. Um, so imagine that you have a heavy stone block, a, a, a brick, if you like, and you um, hold it up like this, and then you want to tip it over. So if you imagine that something like um, a chemical reaction, here's the initial state, the reactant, the product is in a lower energy state when you tip it over. Now, even this object, if to tip it over, you need to apply a certain amount of energy to push it. You need to raise its center of gravity a little bit. Okay, so if, if I imagine I've got this thing sat on my desk, thinking about whether a magnetic field as weak as the Earth's could affect a chemical reaction. It's like imagining a fly bumping into the side of this. The energy of that impact is far too small to tip this thing over. Okay? But imagine, maybe I can find something. This is a bit more satisfactory. This looks a bit more like a brick, okay? So this is where I start. And that's where I finish. So that's my analogy for a chemical reaction. Now, if I can balance this thing just on its edge, so not quite vertical, so at the point where its potential energy is the highest. Yeah? Now, that's a highly unstable state. You know, if I let go of this, it's going to fall one way or the other. And if a fly now bumps into this, even though the energy of that impact is tiny, that could tip it over. Okay, so the point of this is that if you have a highly non-equilibrium state, it can be very, very sensitive to tiny interactions. And so that's essentially what this radical pair mechanism is. You use the energy of sunlight, and that's a lot of energy, to produce the radical pair. And the radical pair is like this thing poised on its edge in a highly non-equilibrium state. Okay, and now, so radicals, as I said earlier, have odd numbers of electrons. And electrons are magnetic. They have a magnetic moment. You can think of them as microscopic magnets. And the reason that they have magnetic moments is that they have a property called spin. And spin is fundamentally quantum mechanical. So the, the word spin suggests that an electron is perhaps like a miniature planet spinning around its axis. Okay, and that's a classical picture. Spin is actually short for spin angular momentum. So you can imagine a spinning object. Um, but of course, electrons are not classical objects. They are microscopic and they behave quantum mechanically. 
And so spin is a fundamentally quantum mechanical property. And so the thing that is in a highly non-equilibrium state when you form a radical pair are the spins of the two electrons. And so it's the interaction of the magnetic moments of the electrons, which are associated with the spins of the electrons. It's the interaction of those with the magnetic field and also with local magnetic fields within the radicals that allow the chemistry to be affected by magnetic fields. So it's difficult to explain. Um, quantum mechanics is a theory. To understand it properly, you need to do the mathematics. Um, it's also difficult to explain without slides and pictures, but I hope that gives you some idea of how it works. I've heard that uh, there's a lot of controversy around the, the mechanism for the bird's ability for magnetoreception. Um, and some people may argue that it's not 100% certain that it's the crypto, uh, cryptochrome 4 protein that allows birds to sense the Earth's magnetic field. How, how would you uh, address people with such con uh, concerns? Um, well, I, I would agree with them. It's absolutely not clear yet that it's cryptochrome 4. It's not clear that it's even a radical pair mechanism. It could be a different mechanism. I think, and many others do as well, that the most likely mechanism is radical pairs, and that the most likely molecule is a cryptochrome, and that amongst the cryptochromes, cryptochrome four is the most likely. But as you say, not everyone agrees with that. Some people think that one of the other bird cryptochromes is more likely. Um, I disagree with that, um, principally on the basis that that particular cryptochrome, at least when you study it as a purified protein, does not bind this crucial flavin cofactor. Now, it's conceivable that inside cells in the bird's body, that cryptochrome may behave differently, but I think it's unlikely. And that's why I favor cryptochrome four. But we don't know for sure that it is cryptochrome four. If it is, then we're not sure exactly what the radicals are within the protein. There are arguments about that as well. So our most recent paper focused on the first radical pair that would be formed, the first stable radical pair at least, long lived, that would be formed by absorption of light. But there are other possibilities. So once you've shifted the electron within the molecule and formed the radicals, that initial pair could be the magnetically sensitive species. But then the electron needs to move back where it came from. And in doing so, it could form a different pair of radicals. And some people think that it's that pair that is responsible for the magnetic compass. Now, I think that's less likely, um, partly because we don't really know what those radicals are. There's much less evidence for their existence. And for various other reasons, it just seems like it's less likely to give um, an efficient magnetic compass, but we don't know for sure. Um, now, there could be other mechanisms. So one possibility is that birds have effectively a microscopic compass needle made out of magnetic iron oxide crystals. Now, this is not um, either or, they could have both. So the evidence is that 
birds have two sorts of magnetic sensors, a, a map sense and a compass. So if you can imagine the old days before GPS and before we all had magnetometers inside our mobile phones, the way that humans used to navigate when we were hiking uh, was to use a map and a compass. So you use the map to locate yourself. In the case of humans, usually by spotting landmarks. And once you know where you are, then you know from the map which direction you want to go, north or south, for example, and you use your compass to work out which direction that is, and off you go. Okay, so the evidence is that the birds have a map sense and a compass sense, as well as all the other information they have from the sun and the stars and so on. And the evidence is that the compass sense is light dependent and is in the eyes, and I would claim is more likely to be radical pairs in cryptochromes than anything else. But the intensity sensor that the birds use to, for geographic location, that's more likely to be based on magnetic iron oxide crystals. And for a while, it was thought that those sensors were in the upper beak. That's now been discredited. Um, there may be something in the upper beak, but we don't know where it is. Um, it might be in the inner ear. There's some evidence for that as well. But the, this alternative mechanism which the birds may use only for detecting the intensity of the magnetic field, and therefore for locating themselves where they are. Um, this could be based on crystals of magnetic iron oxide. So the, the only organism in which we understand magnetoreception are a class of bacteria known as magnetotactic bacteria. And if you look at these animals, they're about a micron long under an electron microscope. You can see that they contain chains of magnets, single crystals of magnetite, magnetic iron oxide. And these crystals, and there may be several hundred of them, are arranged in chains so that they behave like a compass needle. And this compass needle inside the bacterium's body behaves, orients itself in a magnetic field, just like a magnetic compass needle in a human compass. Okay, and so the bacteria need this because they need to know in which direction to swim. They swim along the lines of the Earth's magnetic field. And they need to do this because they live in shallow pools of water. If they get too near the surface, then the high oxygen content will kill them. And they're too light to use gravity. Okay, now, um, clearly the birds don't orient in the same way, but they may have these magnetic iron oxide crystals, magnetosomes, they're called, um, on a microscopic scale. And these could like a compass needle, rotate slightly in the Earth's magnetic field. And if you have then some way of detecting whether the magnetosomes are moving one way or the other inside cells in the bird's body, then that could be a mechanism for magnetic sensing. So that's one of the alternative mechanisms. But there's not much evidence yet for the birds that this is the compass sensor. It's not so obvious why a magnetic iron oxide compass would be light dependent. There's no chemistry involved. It's a physical mechanism. And also there's an unusual property of the bird's compass, which also makes it less likely to be magnetite. So the birds have a compass which is known as an axial compass. 
And what that means is if you suddenly invert the magnetic field as a bird experiences, so instead of pointing in that direction, it points exactly in the opposite direction. If you do that, then the birds can't tell the difference. But if you do that to a compass needle, it'll point in the opposite direction. It'll point south instead of north if you invert the field. So that's exactly what would happen to a magnetite based compass inside a bird's body. But a property of these radical pair reactions is that they are completely insensitive to an exact inversion of the magnetic field. So that's another piece of evidence that the bird's compass is more likely to be radical pairs than magnetite. But all of this is circumstantial. It's, um, we still are some way away from proving that we've got the right mechanism and the right molecule. But evidence is accumulating. Right. And so I'm now talking a little bit more big picture about your research. Um, what all can be inferred and maybe understood about birds' navigational techniques based on your discovery about uh, Cryptochrome 4? And also, how does your work build on the current understanding of avian navigation? Well, it's all about the mechanism. So, I mean, it's, it's, it's absolutely clear that birds have a magnetic compass. No one, I think, doubts that. It's really trying to work out how it works. And that, I think, is, that's the problem that really drives me, the problem I would really like to solve. Um, and it's, it's a difficult problem. Um, we've known, as I say, for 50, 60 years that the birds have this remarkable ability. And we still don't know how it really worked. Now, if we did understand how it worked, then that might be useful in um, conservation of migratory birds. The populations of songbirds um, are dropping. There could be a variety of reasons for that. Um, one of them might be human activity. There may be things that we do that are disrupting birds' ability to navigate when they migrate. And that could be responsible for the drop in global populations of migratory birds. So if we could understand the mechanism, maybe that would be helpful in terms of conservation. So one aspect of this is that we have found that when tested under carefully controlled conditions, the birds are, can be prevented from using their magnetic compass if they are exposed to extraordinarily weak time-dependent electromagnetic fields. Okay, this was discovered by accident. But if you shield them from this background, radio frequency, electromagnetic noise, then they can use their compass again. Now, that's very clear from these tests done in the laboratory. We don't know whether that's relevant at all to birds in the wild. But for sure, for the last hundred years, since mankind has started using electrical power, we are, all of us, humans and animals, subject uh, as a matter of routine to very weak electromagnetic radiation from all kinds of electrical equipment. It's incredibly weak. It almost certainly has no effect on human health, for example. But it may affect birds' ability to migrate, to orient with their magnetic compass. It certainly does when we test them. And so, you know, this is something that 
we might be able to understand better. And it is known that radical power reactions can be affected, not just by static magnetic fields like that of the Earth, but also by time-dependent magnetic fields. And if you like, that's another piece of evidence for a radical pair mechanism for the magnetic compass. But we don't understand all of that either. So, um, yeah, we, what have we learned about the ability of birds to migrate magnetically? Well, I mean, we, we're starting to learn about how precise the magnetic compass is. Now we know from the tests of the birds in the orientation cages that they can detect a five degree change in the direction of a magnetic field. And we suspect that they are more accurate in the wild when they're not under stress in a small cage being tested. Um, now, we, when our experiments get better, we should be able to measure for purified proteins just how sensitive they are to the direction of magnetic field. And so that will give us more of a clue about how precise their magnetic compass is. And that's something that's difficult to measure with birds in free flight in the wild. But it's really all about understanding the mechanism. And that's a fundamental problem, um, but it also may have technological applications. If we could understand this mechanism, then inspired by the biology, we may be able to make a different kind of magnetic sensing device, which might have a variety of different applications. So that's a possibility for the future, some application of all of this research. So finally, uh, we'd like to finish with a more broad question. So not many people would associate quantum mechanics with biology. Um, what's the potential for quantum mechanics to sort of advance fields um, other than itself? And what role does your work play in all of this? Yeah. Um, so the, the, the environment of a molecule inside a cell in a living organism is often described as warm, wet, and noisy. So there's a lot of water around, um, physiological temperature for warm blooded creatures like birds and humans, about 40 Celsius. Um, and it's noisy. There are all sorts of sources of interactions that might interact with quantum systems. And if you compare that environment with the conditions under which quantum mechanical behavior is often observed, then it's often the other extreme. A lot of laser experiments, for example, are done under conditions of very high vacuum and very low temperatures in order that the quantum effects can be as long lived as possible. So quantum physicists working on quantum optics would be dealing with quantum coherence, which is property that is central to this radical pair mechanism and to other areas in which quantum mechanics may play a role in biology, this quantum coherence often, even under these extreme conditions of high vacuum, low temperature and so on, isolated molecules, might be only a few picoseconds at most, so billionths of a second. And that kind of makes it difficult to imagine that in the warm, wet and noisy environment of a living cell, that that coherence could have any relevance at all. So at first sight, it is perhaps surprising that anyone 
gets excited by these quantum mechanics and biology. Well, of course, everything is quantum mechanical, um, uh, but that's not a very helpful description. You know, if it were not for quantum mechanics, molecules would not exist and there wouldn't be any biology, we wouldn't, we wouldn't be here. Um, but when people talk about quantum biology, what they mean is non-trivial quantum effects or quantum effects that cannot be described with classical mechanics. So if we think about this radical power mechanism, the thing that allows the spins of the electrons to respond to magnetic interactions as weak as that of the Earth's magnetic field is because electron spin coherence can be quite long lived, microseconds rather than the picoseconds I mentioned just now. And a microsecond is long enough for a magnetic field as weak as the Earth to have an effect on an electron spin. Okay, so why do electron spins have such slow loss of coherence? And that's because electron spins are, to a large degree, insulated from their surroundings. It's because the magnetic moment of the electron is pretty weak. And so it doesn't interact strongly with its surroundings. So for an electron spin, the surroundings are not very noisy. And the, the warmth and the wetness of a living cell also doesn't affect the electron spins too much. And we did look at this theoretically a couple of years ago. Um, we asked the question, well, just how quantum is this radical pair mechanism? So we know that the electron spin is fundamentally quantum mechanical. There's no classical analog. Nevertheless, some properties of electron spins can be described with quantum with sorry, with classical mechanics. You know, Newton's laws of motion, for example. So if you can describe a quantum phenomenon using classical mechanics, then it's not really interesting in the quantum sense. You would call that perhaps trivially quantum. So we looked at this radical pair mechanism and we came to the conclusion that although some aspects can be described with classical mechanics, if you want this to operate as a compass, then you need quantum mechanics to describe its behavior theoretically. And that gives us evidence that this really is a quantum phenomenon. Now, there are other aspects to quantum biology, energy transfer in photosynthesis, for example, enzyme catalysis. These are areas in which quantum mechanics has been discussed. Um, but these areas don't involve electron spin. They involve different kinds of coherence, which are inherently much shorter lived. That is, they decohere much more rapidly. And that's because they interact much more strongly with their surroundings. For them, the surroundings is much more noisy. But um, there has been a lot of debate about whether aspects of quantum properties could make biological processes more efficient. And that's a distinct possibility. So nature and evolution are not confined to classical mechanics. If there's some advantage of doing things in a fundamentally quantum manner, presumably evolution will exploit that. And so we perhaps shouldn't be surprised to find that there are aspects of biology for which we need fundamentally a quantum mechanical description to understand how they really work in detail. Does that answer your question? Yes, thank you. 
Um, those are pretty much all of the questions that we had. Thank you so much for speaking us with uh, speaking with us today. We had a lot of fun, and we learned a lot. It was really interesting talking to you about your work and your research and all of that. Again, thank you so much. Okay, it was a pleasure. Thank you. That's it for this episode. Huge thanks to Dr. Hoare for appearing on our podcast. Be sure to like and subscribe, and we'll catch you next time.